Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report wherever you get your podcasts and you know the drill. Do me a favor and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Keep us going here, folks. And if you want to find us here, you can join, you find us at Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated. Today, I'm joined by the voice of the commanders, Bram Weinstein. We get into a lot of topics that are pivotal to the commanders offseason, starting with what do you do with Deron Payne? Do you tag him? Do you Can you sign him to a deal? If you tag him, should you consider trading him? him? If so, why? We get into that. We talk about the other free agents, Cam Curl. How much do you pay him? And what is his value here compared to maybe how it would be viewed outside of Washington, considering all that he does for the commanders? Cole Holcomb, what do you do there? So we get into all that. Then we also talk about the roster, Sam Howell. Um, can this team take that jump from eight wins to 10 wins or 11? If so, what will it take? And then we also close out by, I asked Bram about someone who grew up rooting for the Washington Redskins in the 1980s. It was a kind of a big week this, this past week because there were multiple anniversaries from Super Bowls, but also the passing of former Washington general manager, the best general manager in the franchise history, Bobby Beathard. So I got some of Bram's thoughts on that because again, he grew up as a big time fan of franchise. And I know what that, that decade meant to him and to everybody else who was able to follow it. And I know for others who weren't around that you desperately want to see something like that repeated. So anyway, can't promise you that now. It did happen then. Without further ado, here's my conversation with the voice of the commanders, Bram Weinstein. Bram, we still don't know who the offensive coordinator is. We don't know who the owners are going to be. We won't know that for a little while. But we do know there are some decisions to make on this roster, starting with Deron Payne, the defensive tackle, obviously a free agent. We all know that. What do you do with Deron Payne? Uh, I think it, in any other normal offseason, I think you resign him <laughs> to a long-term deal, assuming that he wants to resign here and they're willing to not try to reset a market and try to be Aaron Donald or something like that. Um, so without knowing what their goals are, it's hard to really totally answer it, but this is also not a normal offseason um, and I think the big question that we've been asking you and I, when we talk and really everybody who's around it, what are you authorized to do? Right. Um, and this has nothing to do with filling out the roster and attacking a draft and going after free agents to, you know, fortify position groups. This is the big money deals. And Deron Payne is issue one right now, because um, it, even if they wanted to give him a deal like they gave to John Allen, um, can they? And Ron Rivera has now officially said he's had his meetings with ownership. Right. So what does that mean? I don't know. All that he said that I heard publicly when he spoke to Julie Donaldson a week ago was uh, they're comfortable with what we want to do. But we don't know what that means. And Rivera is typically pretty cryptic about what he wants to do. So um, I expect Deron Payne to get tagged and then a decision will be made. That's what I expect to happen here. And with that decision, so, and you're right, like I keep hearing business as usual, but I don't know what that means. I also know that they absolutely want to sign Payne or they like to resign him. Um, but again, then it's about the numbers. And I know at one point they were reluctant to give him a John Allen deal, but inflation always takes that number up and, and his play has taken that number up as well. You know, and but if you tag him, like, do you try to trade him? Do you just assume he'll play on that and try him again next year? What do you do? So, again, this is, and you'll know more than I will because I don't talk to their agents. Um, but you know, is he willing to play on a tag if push came to shove? Good question. I don't know. It's not sure. So, yet. I don't know. So, um, if he is, then I don't think he'll get moved unless they get surprised with an offer for him. Um, but if he isn't, uh, because, you know, if I'm like, I'm just trying to think through how's this going to go. And 
do they have the you know the authority and the financing backing of current ownership to go give him the type of deal that would settle this and sign him and my gut without knowing for sure says no right now doesn't mean it won't change in the spring whenever ownership is is settled whether it's current ownership or future right. ownership that that can't be settled but that may force them into the summer and into the summer um, if they can't get a deal done, is he willing to play on the tag? So I think they kind of need to know the answer to that question uh, because if he's not, and then they're not timed up right to even give him what he wants, then I think they have to survey the market. Um, but I do think it is their goal to sign him long-term. Yeah. It's just the timing of all this is so tricky. Um, and then what you don't want to have happen is they end up in the summer post the draft and they've got a holdout situation or a problem. So I think they're going to have to, you know, that's all going to have to be, I think at least talk through um, now, you know, before right. before they get around to these to these times. Like John Allen wasn't a free agent when they talked to him. Terry McLaurin was not a free agent when they talked to him. Deron Payne is like this could get this could become a stalemate, and not because they don't want him, but because of circumstances. Right, and I think that's a big key because here's the other part of it too. If you put him on the tag and he's willing to play on the tag. Well, if you're if you're Dan Snyder, like you don't care because none of that money's coming out of your pocket unless you somehow still own the team at that point. Because it's not there's no upfront money with the tag. It's also pay, the, right. It's pay as you go. Right. This is like every. It doesn't matter who the owner is. You can go to the salary cap <laughs> barrier, and if he fits under the salary cap, then this is what we're talking about is the the escrow payment that Correct. goes into a bank you know, for $60 million that right. like, that's the part we don't know right. whether this team is going to do that on the behest of future ownership. Right. And then, the, then the key date, like you said, if, if he is, or it isn't, let's say he's like, well, let's see what the new owners want to do. And then you have a July 15th deadline during the summer for anybody who plays in the tag. What do you think his market value? And I, this is something I, I'm going to kind of, I'm kind of get it gathering over the next month or so, what his market value would be as far as a trade goes. Prior to this, it was a third round pick. Now, right. some teams, my understanding is, were like they probably go to a second round pick, but this is before the trade deadline in the fall. If they knew they could sign him to a long term deal, otherwise, it's a third round pick. Do you think he'd have more value than that, or do you think they'd be trading him at a high point given his production this year? if someone actually offered him a low end first round pick, I actually think Washington has to seriously, seriously consider taking it regardless of whether they want to resign him or not. Um, so I, you know, I, I would think that second round pick is what gets their ears perked. Um, and so I think that's the starting point of the conversation because if he does leave via free agency, whether it's, it won't be this year, but next year, um, that's what you're looking at in a compensatory pick for him. So why in the world would they trade him for a third round pick now right, when they would. could force him to play on the roster on the franchise tag, but they will lose him. Um, the object is you have to get something, you know, of value to actually make this move. And then there's, you know, the other part of this, which is all along we've known it's going to be very difficult to pay all four of these defensive linemen uh, when the time has come. One's already been settled. Right. Payne always felt like the odd man out because you figure Sweater Young, well, if they're going to re-sign Payne and they go, let's build from the inside out, well, that means next year's an enormous year for Sweat and Young. And so, I, you know, one or the other is, you know, likely going to be voted off the island. You know, right. so it's going to be, this is really tricky. I mean, they've hit this point where they have to make this decision. Duran has earned this contract. I don't want to, yeah. like, I don't want to give off any impression that he hasn't. He really has. Um, that said... The idea that he will replicate double-digit sacks as an interior defensive lineman is a little fool's goldie. Um, and you know, the idea of selling high is not like is not really off the table, in my opinion. But if you what you think is that the core of your uh defense being what was a top five defense a year ago and moving forward is the play of the interior defensive line, then I don't know how you don't resign him or figure it out. Just the problem is, you know, like can they actually do that? in the here and now is he willing to be understanding about that uh is he willing to trust them that when ownership is clarified they will address it like that's something that he and his agent need to figure out and deal with um but to answer your question like 
I would think a second round pick is very possible for him. And I would think if someone actually offered a low first round pick, which would surprise me because you have to pay him at the same time, if that was on the table, I think it'd be hard pressed for this front office not to accept it. Yeah. The second round pick, I think right now you, you know, that would be a bare minimum for what I would want. And maybe if it's depending on where it is in the second round, you may want a second pick along with that Yeah, just because of how good he is. And and if you think he's still ascending, because I don't think it's not like he was a lazy guy in the past who suddenly had this great off season and suddenly parlayed it into this. I think he's been a very good player who had a great year. No doubt. And, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't feel like this is a, well, I think you're right. The 11 and a half sacks is very hard to duplicate from an interior guy. And the sack numbers are always a little bit, you know, then it's some somewhat circum. you know, you can be have a great year and not get maybe he only have seven sacks but you have a great year that's right sacks are just they're hard to always come by and they're hard to quantify i mean shoot i remember when richie owens this is a name from the past remember him way back in the day i think he had one year was like 11 or 13 sacks but that's about all he did so sack numbers can be skewed but the interior success that he's had pain has been very real, and I don't think that's going to change. The tackles for losses and sacks at that position are very telling. I mean, right. he had he was great, an outstanding season. He was fantastic. I, like, yes, he was. Yeah. And and there's no doubt about that. So then the other part of that too is because then it's like, well, can you pay all this this entire group to stay together? And if you're paying him, do you then go to the draft and say, you know what, you better take a defensive end somewhere high? just in case like maybe this guy you you maybe you need him to replace a Montez or a Chase Young down the road I mean the interesting part of them if they were to pay him and I, I again I want to reiterate I think they do it's just I oh, think they, there's I, some I know they do. I think there are, I think there are some circumstances here that are holding up this process a little bit and until we get some public clarity about what right. that is it may continue to but if they do pay him and they have John Allen you know paid um next year, for Sweat and Young, they'll be both under the microscope yeah. in a big way. Like Chase Young is going to have to look like the number two overall pick again. Hopefully his knee will allow him to do that. Um, and then Montez Sweat will be going into the final year of his contract. And it will feel like that they will have to make a choice about who are they going to retain. And probably that choice will be made. And then there's a third player here that needs to be dealt with right now. And that's Cam Curl. They're going to That's have to deal with him too. So we're talking about a lot of money to keep this group together, at least the what they agree are the pivotal points of it. I, If it's up to them, they wouldn't lose anybody, but welcome to a cap era where you have to make very hard choices and they're hitting them over the next two off seasons. And with Cam, because, you know, he does a lot for them. I'm a, I, he's a terrific player. Doesn't make big plays in terms of, in terms of interceptions, forced fumbles and all that. How do you view him? And, you know, if, if that price tag is that 15 to 16 range, are you comfortable with that? Oh boy. Mm. So, and some of that's going to depend on the cap. Cause like you throw, I throw out these numbers, but the cap is going up. Okay. Like it is so abundantly clear to me that when he plays or doesn't play, there's a big difference in how they play collectively. And there's just no argument about it. So, you know, do the numbers tell the story of how important he is to them? Probably not. Um, here's the better question with that. If he were a free agent, would he get that on an open market? Would people look at him like Derwin James or Jamal no. Adams? Would they look at him that way and I, this is no offense to Camp Curl. I don't think they would. Yeah. So, you know, is he going to get a enormous raise from where he is? Yeah. yeah. Like, and I think to tie him up, they're going to have to do that. But he does not scream to me somebody who resets the safety market. No. Um, and, you know, maybe some of that is just national profile. And maybe some of that is, to your point, He's not blowing games up, but I will, you know, sit here and raise the flag for this guy is critical to oh, what I, they've a been thousand doing. percent agree. Yeah. yeah. So what is he worth on the open market is where they're going to have to like, I think, figure out what that is. Um, and I do think like he's, 
the perfect example of someone I'd like to see them get ahead of. Otherwise, they're going to be franchising him, and then they are going to be in that conversation right. with him. So, you know, I, I think this one's this one's even trickier than Payne, frankly. Payne earned himself a, you know, top five to ten defensive tackle contract. The question is whether Washington's going to give it to him. Cam Curl uh, might be, you know, a top five safety. You know, he certainly plays multiple roles for them and really, really well. But what's the price point on that if he's not perceived outside of here like Derwin James or Jamal Adams? I don't know. Are you ready for the biggest Sunday in sports? DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 57, has all the Super Bowl action you need. New customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, all customers can get in on Super Bowl 57 excitement with DraftKings Happy Hour Super Boosts. Check the DraftKings Sportsbook app every day between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Time to see what prop bet will be boosted. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code KIME, K-E-I-M. New customers can bet $5 on Super Bowl 57 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code KIME. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. And I think the hard part with the curl is the cost of replacing him because of all that he does. It's not as simple as like, oh, you're replacing a safety. You're replacing a safety who can play, who can cover tight ends and backs. You're replacing, you have to replace safety who can drop down and play that Buffalo nickel hybrid safety linebacker role that is so crucial to what they want to do. So, you know, when you talk to coaches here, they're like, this guy knows at least four or five, six, six different positions yeah. because of how what he can do. So you're replacing that. In some ways, and this might be, I don't know if there's a good comparison. He's almost like an Alex Smith is on their defense, right? That kind of a game manager quarterback who is so crucial to what they do and knows how to play, knows how to get guys in spots. And a Derek Forrest is a better player when Cam Curl is out there. Oh, so, you know, I mean, so that, like that's an underrated a, part of this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, Derek Forrest's ascension really started when Cam Curl was playing next right. to him. Yeah, no, and that's and that's a big part. So I think it's going to be an interesting one. You know, obviously they're going to want to keep him because they know the importance to him, and Ron Rivera knows it to the point where he's going to tell people in the media, "Don't praise him because then it jacks up his yeah. price." Well, guess what? His agents already know this. They already know. You know, they don't want they don't want to sit there and outwardly heap a ton of praise on him, even though they did during the year and maybe drive up that price. But again, they're not, his, his agents aren't fools. They know yeah. his value here. He, he's a really tricky one, but I mean, I do think that like it benefits both sides to get something done. Now cam is a seventh round pick, which means he's not making any real money right now. So they can rip that up and give him a nice signing bonus and change all of that and make him happy and keep him here long-term. Um, but I think he is going to have to be, in my opinion, I think he would have to be a little bit flexible about, what tier he's going to reach salary wise um, because it would be my guess that on the open market, while he will probably make a really good salary, I don't think people will perceive him as Derwin James. So and right. I think it's going to be, I don't, I just don't see a team showing up and saying, let's reset the safety market with him. Right. And so again, as long as he's going to have a reasonable expectation about it, then I think a deal can be had for sure. Right. And I think again, it goes, the reason why they wouldn't go there is because the, the inner you, you're going to want your, teams are going to pay for the big plays, the interceptions, the fumble recoveries and all that. And I think his value, again, his value here comes in doing so many different things. And then it's like, how does a team perceive him, how they're going to use him? And this team uses him all over the place. Yeah. So in some ways, the value may be just like some other play, his value would be, might be greater here than it might be somewhere else because of how they use him. And yeah. I think that the, the real, there's two spots on the defense that I think would like, supercharge it and make it not just a stout defense, but a game changing defense. If they had a playmaking corner, right. um, you know, because like in cam curls case, I'm not expecting him to have 10 interceptions or no. 10 force fumbles or all that stuff. But like, here's what I know when he's in there, bad things don't happen, when right. he's in there, he which it means he's game. like the forts held down here. And there's an extraordinary value to that. But if this team could find, not just a good corner, but a playmaking corner, someone who actually scares the offense a little bit to throw it his way, could change games a little bit, yep. a lot of passes, defense, a couple of picks here and there. 
Um, I think that would be a big upgrade. And, you know, one more linebacker, maybe a playmaking style linebacker. They have such a good offensive line. And maybe Davis becomes this. Um, they have, su- I mean, defensive line. They have such a good defensive line that it should be field day for somebody who's playing middle linebacker for this team. So hopefully they'll find the right young person to go in there, whether it's Cole Holcomb or someone else. But I do think the the next level thing for them is whether it's through the draft or free agency, a playmaking corner, I think yes. would be a big, big, big difference for them. Yeah. And, and I, and they des- they definitely need that. Would you, cause Holcomb's a free agent too. What do you do? Uh, okay. So I want to know what his price is. Um, I know he's really well liked. Um, I'm not paying him like foyer Aluakon last year. No. Like that's not happening. No. So, uh, I think it's going to come down to price and, you know, him being hurt for half the season certainly isn't going to help him on the open market. So let's see what the price two is. Seasons where um, he's had injuries like that. I would want to, br- if the price is right, right. I'd want to bring him back and fortify the position at the same time and feel pretty good about that. Yeah. If the price isn't right, right. Then I think you're going to look elsewhere, but they, they've got, you know, they need three new bodies in that position group. Yes. Like it's not one, like they yeah. need, you know, they're, that's a thin, that's the thinnest spot on the team. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think with Holcomb, you know, I don't think his market value is going to be all that high just because, he, he is coming off an injury. It's been a couple of injuries now. So I think they can get him at a reduced, probably, probably. And I, this, I'm going to have Joel Corey on here soon to talk about values for guys and all that. But I would think you can get him at a better price. But I'm like you. You absolutely have to keep looking for young guys there who can yep. ascend to becoming a playmaker. Because, you know, it's funny because you look around the NFL and you get a lot of times these guys, these star linebackers in free agency coming out. Well, they were fifth and sixth round picks, but they're playing behind really good fronts if you have a really good front yes. those linebackers should be able to play off that not you know yeah. i mean the difference between this defense and san francisco is to me is like the play of those linebackers is terrific out there i think you need to i mean you need to listen when you get fred warner you right and he's a different guy yes he's different if you but i i agree with you like you know i and this this goes back to what are you know how do you perceive roster building in a cap era what right. do you what do you put money into and for me, it's offensive and defensive line. Right. Um, a really good playmaking player in the back end. That is Cam Curl to some degree. A really good playmaking corner. And then obviously a quarterback if you have a special quarterback. That's where I look where you put me. You, you're forced to it receiver now. But like that's where I think you put money. That's That's how I look at it. So I don't think they have to overspend to go get a linebacker in here. I think they need to find the right linebacker that's right. playing behind what is the strength of their team a at times dominating defensive line? It right. should be a field day for a player like that back there. Absolutely. The other thing is going back to the Cam Curl stuff, the playmaker safety who's made more plays is Derek Forrest. But yes, I think he's, he's become made- more of a playmaker. Um, to your point, I think you insinuated this earlier. There's still a ways to go for him to be a consistent player on the back end. Right. That's my opinion of it. I think he had an incredible second year. I think he validated the reason of getting rid of land, of allowing Landon Collins to leave that like they didn't need him. They've got a much cheaper version, you know, and a guy who is a big hitter, which I love about him is, you know, has a lot of speed, really good, really good kid. You know, there's a lot of parts about him that I really, really like um, uh, that said, like it is clear as day. There's a ways to go for him sure. and cam curl needed to be back there quarterbacking the whole thing. Otherwise mistakes were happening. Right. So he's better when curls playing. Right. Sure. And I think those play, I think some of those plays he makes are help because he's in better position yeah. because of the presence of cam curl. So there you go. How close do you think this team is to getting to that double digit win total? And can Sam Howell be a guy that helps him get there? I don't know. I mean, like, I just haven't seen enough of them to really know and render a judgment either way. Um, They seem committed to finding out. Uh, So it sounds like this is really what they're going to go with this spring, that it will be Hal and a veteran, whether it's Taylor Heineke or someone else, but of that price point. So Hal's going to get really every opportunity to be the number one starting quarterback with a, I guess, exception of, if for some reason Lamar Jackson is actually available, I can't imagine, you know, that they wouldn't at least have a conversation about something like that. Or if Justin Fields is really available, I don't know how you don't really have a conversation about something like that, but short of those things, they clearly are not interested in going 
the route of paying $35 million for Derek Carr, $30 million for Jimmy Garoppolo again. They're not going to do that. So he's going to get every opportunity to do it. Um, to me, the first and foremost, most important thing that they need to do, regardless of their quarterback, is fix their offensive line, and they need to invest in it big time. And I, that's draft and free agency. Yeah. They've got to get younger. They've got to be willing to spend some money on it. And they've got to get some higher level talent out there and more reliable, hopefully more reliable talent because age and injury really caught up with them this year. And I, that to me is going to be the most important part of free agency in the draft. In my opinion, I don't think they can fix everything. Like I think they could use a playmaking corner. I would make a case that could be a first round pick. I think they need a tackle very badly. I can make a case. That's a first round pick. Right. They clearly need to address the linebacking core with two or three players like, and you know, and the offensive line, are they going to do all of this in one off season? I highly doubt it. Right? Like it seems like there's a lot to get to, but to me, because of the skill position people that they have, if they don't invest in the offensive line, they're doing a disservice to Sam Howell coming out of the gate. So to me, paramount issue one, deal with pain and curl and Holcomb to some degree. Um, and then issue number two, what is your plan at offensive line? Are you drafting a tackle? Are you going to sign guards on the open market? Like, are you drafting a lot of offensive linemen in the draft? How are you viewing it? What position does Sam Cosme play? How are you addressing center? I think this is the unit that needs to be fixed this off season. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, and you know, regardless of who comes in at the OC position, it's the number one thing is fixing that group. Because if you yeah. don't, if you don't get at, at athleticism at guard with something you had talked about a lot last off season. And if you don't add that, then you're going to be in trouble regardless of who's at quarterback. Um, I do think, you know, it's funny because with Hall, I know they kind of view him as a better version of Taylor Heineke, so like the thought there is, well, if they can win eight games or so with Heineke, if you have a better version of him, can you win 10 or maybe 11? Maybe. But again, I mean, a lot listen, of this, so much of it depends defense, on the John, like get yeah. a top five defense with so many, like with a weak linebacking core and then lost their middle linebacker and had no real replacement for him. And, you know, the guy who was supposed to be their top corner was traded mid season and they were really thin there and they had a top five defense. Like, it's it's there for them if they fortify a couple of things, but they've got to fix the offensive line. They have to. Yeah. And, you know, again, on how and it's, it's such a small, you know, too small select amount of plays to go off of. But his accuracy in that one game that he played was really striking to me. Yeah. Like it was OK. Like if this is what it's going to be on the regular, then we got something here that maybe we can grow with with him. Well, you know what also, and it's funny because when I talked to players about him, they liked the accuracy. They liked how he can feather the ball and th some touch throws. But I think what they also like is he has a little bit of moxie to, he has moxie to him, but that the interception in that game did not cripple him. And we saw like when Kirk Cousins was here, if he threw an interception when he was early on, he would have a hard time recovering. They liked how he bounced back from that interception yeah. in, the, in the Dallas game. So again, very small sample size. And that, that game will be over. By the time we get to mid July, that game will have been dissected. Like it's the super bowl because, it, because of what it may mean or not, yeah. but it's going to be over analyzed. Eventually we're going to like, you know, we're going to break, I'm going to have a podcast on and we're going to go over Howell's 11th completion today for 20 minutes. <laughs> so that might be what we get to at this point in the offseason. At least I'm not going to be watching uh, every Indianapolis Colts game from a year ago, <laughs> which I had to oh do last offseason. <laughs> what a big what a big swing and a miss there. So this is the last thing I want to get to is um, we're taping this on a Thursday. This is going to air on Sunday night, Monday, whatever. But this has been a kind of a big week if you're a Redskins fan, an emotional week because – multiple anniversaries of Super Bowls and then the death of Bobby Beathard. Yep. What what do you like for you? What was what do I mean, how is that swirl of memories for you? I read your piece with Doug Williams. I thought it was great, by the way. I think everybody Thank should you. read it from by the time you hear this, you know, it'll be a few days old. So you'll have to probably cycle through to find it. But well I it's it gonna was... be back up on the site on over yeah. the weekend yeah. um because the Tom Brady news kind of pushed it to the, yeah, side, just to the a little side a little bit. Yeah. So they're running it back uh, out this weekend. Your piece was great. Obviously, you have an interview with Doug. Um, you know, look, for me as a kid, the 80s are, you know, my childhood. Um, and Doug Williams, you know, that quarter is the, the the commanders may win another Super Bowl. They'll never win it like that ever again. They He had 
what was five touchdowns and 18 plays. Just, just think about that in a Super Bowl for a minute. I mean, it was as if all karma and magic had decided to descend on behalf of the organization. You know, it just was, it's an amazing moment. And then all the, you know, historical context that goes with it and why Doug Williams is legendary because of being a first. Um, shouldn't have been a first, but was because it was a different time. Um, I do think it's really neat, you know, that here we are. It took 35 years to get two black quarterbacks to play one another, which I think is odd that it took that long for that to happen. But I think it's the first of many, you know, like obviously perceptions have changed. So that's that's all really cool. Reliving the 80s for me will never get old. Um, you know, they are it is the time when this team was at its best. It was a glory era. Everything about it, like was positive. You know, Joe Gibbs was positive. The players were positive. Jack Kent Cook was perceived as positive. Bobby Beathard was very positive and he is by far bar none not close best gm in washington sports history go look at his 1981 draft where he selected and i thought this was really funny when i saw this his first two picks are mark may and russ grimm in the twitter era how do you think uh fans would have reacted to two interior offensive linemen being your first two picks what are they draft? doing <laughs> what are they doing what do you do they would have gone crazy meantime one's in the hall of fame and one could be and were the basis and the you know the starting point of the hogs and oh by the way joe jacoby was picked in the same draft as an undrafted free agent dexter manley was selected his draft picks were hits art monks in the hall of fame daryl green's in the hall of fame manley would be if he didn't have personal problems you know i I, that derailed a lot of his career um he just he was he was clearly one of the best in the business we were very lucky to have him um, and then, of course, he hired Joe Gibbs. So, you know, he hired the greatest coach in Washington sports history. So, um, you know, sad to see him go. I know he's been in very bad failing health for a long time. So, um, you know, I, it's there might be some level of relief for the family. Uh, so but he was, you know, obviously um, I didn't know him very well. And I only met him a couple of times. And this is obviously after he had his run in Washington. But he seemed like and everyone is writing this today such a genuinely nice guy. You know, right. the people got along with him, liked him. And clearly he had an acumen to spot talent like few ever did. Yeah, he did. And, and creatively too, because it's not like they had a lot of first round picks during that era. I think it was what two and it was Daryl green and, and art monk were the two first round picks. Yep. So, you know, it was pretty good. And speaking of the Twitter era, imagine if Gibbs, a guy, they not a lot of people n- knew a ton about starts. Oh, yeah. and five. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, Joe Gibbs, when he was hired, I, I would like it this way. It, there was a little bit of Nick Sirianni. Like, who? Yeah. Who's that? Like, what are you talking about? And, uh, you know, obviously he's turned out to be, you know, one of the two, three, four, five greatest coaches in NFL history. Certainly the greatest ones ever come through here. And, um, you know, it's funny, like I was thinking about the Super Bowl this week with Bobby Beathard because Nick Sirianni's second year in the Super Bowl. And I remember when he was hired and everybody was like, who in the world? Like, right. where, where'd they even find that guy? And granted, and, you know, maybe Howie Roseman is a modern day Bobby Beathard. He's got quite an eye for talent up there in Philadelphia. And, you know, it's funny because with Gibbs and this is the last thing, but like with Gibbs, it's funny because what you hear from people who work for the Gibbs organization now is what you heard during the eighties with this team as well, which is why would you ever want to leave here? That, you yeah. know, love working for this guy, love working here. And I think that's what this organization needs to get back to where you actually hear people over and over saying that all the time. And that's, that was true then. And it was, you know, it's true for Gibbs now. And it's always, you know, you get the right people, you treat them right. And they want to stay. And, and that's, yeah, what I think kind of highlighted that that period for for this franchise. Yeah, it was there was really I mean, but winning cures a lot of things and they Absolutely. won a lot. And, yep. you know, it, everything's feel good when you're winning. Uh, um, yes. That's you know, and there's good. a lot. You know, there's a larger conversation we could do at another time about the Eagles, like having done yep. what they've done feels actually very 80s Redskins to me where. Yeah, they had the same coach, but like three different starting quarterbacks. None of them are in the Hall of Fame. They ended up going to four Super Bowls. They won three of them. I mean, that's as unprecedented a run as anybody has ever really had. Well, think about what the Eagles are doing right now. Like they keep rebooting. They've been to three Super Bowls with three different coaches and three different quarterbacks, two of which are definitively not going to be in the Hall of Fame. And one of them who Jalen Hurts is going to have to have a really good career to get there. Like, just think about that for a second. Like how they've done that is worth a discussion for sure. It is. And I talked about that with Dan Graziano, which is on the podcast that ran Friday, just a little bit about that because it is impressive. But this group, Bram, going back to your earlier conversation is 
It's that offense started with the offensive line. Yes. And so like, that is the key. Like Hertz's development was crucial and, and getting other playmakers, but everything started with that offensive line and allowed them to build out from there. Yes. And that to me is why paramount issue. Number one for Ron Rivera moving forward is to do his best to do as much as he can to fix the offensive line and give Sam Howell and this collection of skill position players a chance to show what they can really do. And we'll end on that one. Bram, thank you very much. Yep. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Bram for joining me and thank you as always for listening. I'll be back with another episode on Wednesday. I'll talk to you next time.